All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm Vice President for Policy Programs here at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Institute's Economic Opportunities Program. Um, the Institute's Economic Opportunities Program, we advance promising policy strategies and ideas to help low and moderate income Americans connect to and thrive in a changing economy. We look at two basic strands. We try to help people um, connect to business ownership and, and developing business assets as an opportunity strategy. But we also spend quite a lot of time thinking about how do we connect people to work? How do we connect people to good jobs? And how do we stimulate the creation of good jobs? Uh, at the Working in America series, we really uh, think a lot about what's going on uh, in the changing nature of work in the United States. Um, how should we understand that? How should we think about it? And importantly, what does that mean for the vast majority of American people and families who support themselves on their earnings through their work? Um, we are uh, delighted to have the support of the Ford Foundation, the Walmart Foundation, and the Prudential Foundation for our Working in America series. And we're very grateful to them for their uh, thought partnership and support as we uh, bring this series to you. Um, uh, so today's conversation is around um, farm workers, and, and we have a, have a treat today because we have uh, both an author who's going to be talking about her, her book and a, and a panel uh, to include uh, sort of the, the key players in the story that, that she's written about um, who will be in a conversation today. So we're excited about that. And you know, um, it's interesting to have a conversation about farm workers. So I don't know how many of you looked at the jobs report last Friday, and we think about jobs and the creation of work. But the thing is, farm workers aren't even counted in those statistics about who's working in America. Um, there are, we think about work, um, you know, and we frequently don't think about farm work. We think about a, an economy that's gone from farms to factories now to service and technology. Uh, but nonetheless, there's still over a million, and we don't have very good counts, as our uh, little fact sheet on your chairs will tell you, um, but over a million workers who are responsible for the food and uh, the fruits and vegetables, by and large, that we eat. So, um, so it's important to think about farm work, and I think we have a really exciting uh, story today, today to think not only about that sector, but also about how workers in that sector really kind of um, took charge and, and how that can be uh, related to other kinds of work in, in our economy. So we're excited about today's conversation. Um, and just before we start, I want to make a, co a couple of announcements. We are um, recording and live streaming. Um, we're very excited to have our colleagues from C-SPAN here with us today. So if you have a phone with you, please do silence it. Um, but please do tweet. Our hashtag <laughs> is TalkGoodJobs. Um, and uh, I... We will also have um, books on sale uh, today after the event. Um, they're on a discounted price, and we have the author here to sign them for you. So we will have book signing at the end of the event. So uh, please take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and now, uh, 
I want to introduce um, the author of I Am Not Attractor, Susan Marquis, who's going to start us off with some brief remarks about the book. Immediately, she was at Rand for a different purpose entirely. <coughs> As she started talking, I recognized there was a kindred spirit here. And we started talking about the coalition, about the fair food program, and uh, knew this was uh, a topic that would resonate with her organization, with Aspen. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to you. And thank you to Claire, as well, who is awesome, who has set this all up. Um, you know, what if? What if we could actually change the world? What if you could actually affect real change that affects real people? What if we could do more than talk about a problem, more than protest about a problem, more than raise visibility of a problem, more than research about a problem, and actually fix that problem? What if we could actually solve it? I mean, that's something that's motivated me for quite a while. Um, I'm dean of the Party of Rand Graduate School. I'm at the Rand Corporation. And increasingly, the school itself is focused on not just studying problems, but actually affecting real change. So that's what this book is about. That's what this story is about, changing the world. Um, let me step back for just a moment. I, don't, I, I didn't grow up in the labor world. I mean, I worked, but I didn't study it. Um, that's not really who I am. I grew up in guns and bombs. I grew up in the Defense Department here in Washington, DC, working in the Pentagon. I left the Pentagon uh, in 2002, moved over to a nonprofit government consulting firm, and then uh, became dean of the Party Rand Graduate School and now vice president for innovation at Rand uh, almost 10 years ago. So I, so I became dean of the school. What do deans do? They raise money. And they meet board members. So I'm traveling around the country, flying to meet this board member and that. And I'm heading to Naples to meet uh, David Wang. Uh, interesting character, to say the least. I'll say more about him in just a second. But as I'm traveling, I haven't had a lot of time. I've got this old copy of Gourmet Magazine, a couple months old, one of the last issues. I think it's the March issue. And I'm flipping through it. Roast chicken for two, elegant and easy. Korean, the new soul food. It's a great issue. I'm loving this. And then I flipped to an article by Barry Estabrook. The tomatoes you're eating may have been picked by the hands of a slave. OK, that got my attention. And I'm a bit of a, I don't like the term, but foodie. I'm a good cook. I'm not allowed to say that. I've got some people here who've eaten my food before. It's not bad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a good cook. I care a lot about food. I care about food policy. I've gotten to know my farmers. I've gotten, I care about sustainable agriculture. I care about the treatment of animals. Uh, but I never thought about the people. I'd never thought about the people who put the food on our table. And Barry's article got me thinking about that. And they're talking about this coalition of Immokalee workers, because I didn't actually know how to say Immokalee then. Got my attention, stick it back in my bag, and go meet David Wang. And David is a 80-something-year-old Chinese-American engineer. He uh, doesn't really do the small talk thing. He's much more about being very direct. I'm going to meet him. I'm a civil servant at heart, a public servant at heart, and I'm going up to this penthouse apartment. And it's a little unnerving. The elevator opens up into his apartment. And we sit in this really formal living room. And I can hardly see him on the other side of the room because of the glare from the bay, uh, from the floor to ceiling windows. And it's not going particularly well. Um, we're really, he doesn't care about cute students to begin with. And so this is not very helpful if you're a dean of a school. And then he says something, I realize, oh, wait, isn't that those tomato pickers in Immokalee? He then tells me rhymes with broccoli, Immokalee. Um, and David and I connect, and I start learning about the coalition. I start learning about what they're trying to accomplish. I start learning about the progress they've made. Eventually, uh, David introduces me to Greg and to Laura and to Gerardo and Lucas, and I go and visit. And the question is, I, this is really interesting. I care. It, it, it is horrible 
what has been happening, and I'm like everyone else, appalled by the conditions that are rampant in American agricultural today. These are problems that go back, to, they're in the bones of our country. They go back to slavery, they go back to our uneven relationship with, immigration, with immigrants and immigration. They go back to Jim Crow era, um, rampant you know, wage theft, uh, violence, uh, beatings, gun violence, sexual assault, all the way to modern day slavery. Um, I'm appalled, but that's not much of a story. That's a story that's been told and it's not what I was going to bring uh, to this story. So right around the time I'm meeting with a coalition, something astonishing happens. John S. Forms is the first grower who breaks with the, uh, the rather strong brotherhood of growers and signs with a coalition. And when he does so and when the other growers follow, suddenly we've gone from confrontation to collaboration, this partnership that's never existed before between the workers, the growers, and the top of the food chain. And that's when it starts to come together. Because at that point, the campaign for fair food becomes the fair food program. And they're able to implement this program uh, in a, very quickly. And you see the change within months. Within a, a year or 18 months, they've eliminated the conditions that allowed these abuses to occur. That's the story. And it's a story not just about farm workers, it's about affecting real and sustainable change. It's a story that's a model for all that we're trying to do. It's a story that is a model for the future of labor in the United States and internationally. And that's the story I recognized I could tell. I could, I could tell because what I could talk about is why did this work? When corporate so most social responsibility programs, particularly corporate social responsibility programs, have little effect except having us as consumers feel good because we bought our fair trade coffee. This is about a program that works. So why did this work and who did this work? And that's the story that I try to tell and I'm not a tractor. We're going to have the people who've done this work on stage in just a moment, but I want to talk for a moment why I think it worked. And the first is that because the change came from within, to affect real and sustainable change, it can't be directed from the outside. It actually has to come from the people within the system. And in this case, it was within the workers themselves. This idea of the workers informing, of um, driving the change that happened, and of the community, and all those who are actually in the community, as opposed to just out, outside activists. The second reason I think this worked is because in order to affect real change, if you want to change the system, you've got to actually understand the system. And you've got to understand it from end to end. And that's what the coalition figured out. It fits and starts. It took a little while. But when they made the change in the late 1990s, they looked outside the farm gate. They looked beyond their immediate employers. And they looked to the system as a whole. And they saw that system as the workers the crew leaders, the growers, the buyers, and even the consumers. And they saw that the strength, the power, was at the top of the food chain. It's where the power is. It's where the resources are. But it also provided a vulnerability, because the same brands that had strength in the marketplace, protecting that brand was a vulnerability. And that's what the coalition went after. The third reason I think this worked, why did this work, is because they have a coherent cohesive and a powerful story, and they stuck with it. It's incredible when you go and visit them. They've had a lot of visitors lately, so you may want to hold off on that. <laughs> They're a little overwhelmed, perhaps. But um, it doesn't matter who you talk to. It's not like they're cherry-picking people to talk to. It's every worker I spoke with, every ally I spoke with, they had the same message. And it had to do with declaring rights, human rights about treating every person with dignity, ensuring that because of that dignity, they had a safe place to work, and they could get a reasonable amount of pay. Um, the story was effective in developing, in, in establishing and communicating with allies. Allies became very important to this movement, uh, particularly faith-based organizations and the Student Farm Worker Alliance, so alliances uh, with uh, the campuses themselves. They didn't drive this change but they identified with what the workers were fighting for, and they uh, were able to support it. 
The fourth thing, I think I've got my numbers right here, uh, has to do with implementation. And, you know, I'm a policy wonk, perhaps. I like to think I'm actually a researcher and an analyst rather than a policy wonk. But implementation matters. And implementation is one of those terms we dismiss. It's not very interesting, it's bureaucratic, et cetera. But one of the things the coalition did, and this is a lesson for all of us who want to affect change, is they paid as much attention to what they were implementing, to the program that would be put in place, as they did to the campaign itself. We can all feel good marching in the streets. We can all feel good raising issues. But if you don't know what you're going to do once you win, you're not going to have any effect. And it's the implementation piece that resulted in the comprehensiveness of the fair food program that is not seen in any other uh, labor program, any other social responsibility program. It begins with the workers themselves, whose expertise was, were drawn upon in order to uh, develop the code of conduct. Education of the workers, so everyone knows what their rights are. Monitoring that includes not only scheduled and unscheduled audits by a third party, the Fair Food Standards Council, but also the workers themselves. So you have 30,000 or more in every row on every farm monitoring their own rights. It's most of all this idea of consequences. There's a lot of programs out there that have codes of conduct, standards, et cetera, and those are good. And they are raising issues and saying, here's what's expected. But the consequences are minimal to non-existent for violating those standards. With a fair food program, the consequences are real. The growers lose access to this market because the buyers who've signed on, the fast food giants and the grocery stores, will not buy from them, cannot buy from them in a legally binding agreement. They cannot buy from them uh, if they are not in compliance with the standards. And it's those real world market consequences that makes all the difference. That only comes when you think about implementation. And the last piece I want to highlight is the people themselves. But it takes people who are courageous, who are clever, innovative, smart, but most of all, stick with it. This is not an easy battle. This is started in the early 1990s. It took courage to change the approach they had uh, adopted, a more traditional approach with protests and strikes in the 1990s, and recognize they had not this wasn't achieving the transformational change. It takes sticking with it to, our, to negotiate with, to, put, to campaign against and then uh, negotiate with the fast food giants and the grocery stores, so the buyers. And it takes persistence to put the attention, to pay attention to the details necessary to implement. And that's a remarkable skill set. So the people, the system matters, the approach matters, and these people you're about to meet matter a great deal. So I think that sums it up. And uh, for now, that's an overview. And now we get to dive into the fun part, the conversation. Great. Thank you, Susan. And uh, don't sit down there. You can sit down up here. And I'll invite the other panelists to, uh, to take the stage at this, at this point. Um, and I will just briefly, you have bios and materials on them all in your, in, uh, in your packet. So um, I'm not going to go over their bio, but I do encourage you to take a look at that. I'm just briefly going to put names to faces. So um, to, your, uh, to your far right to, um, is um, uh, Greg Asbed, uh, co-founder, leader, and organizer of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Um, next to Greg is... Um, okay, the one who challenges me with pronunciation, Gerardo Reyes Chavez, fr thank yeah. you, <laughs> uh, who is also a leader and organizer with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Um, next to Gerardo is John S. Forms, uh, CEO of Sunripe, Sunripe Certified Brands. Um, next to John is Susan that we just heard from, and we're delighted to have moderating today's conversation uh, Stephen Greenhouse, who was a labor reporter for the New York Times for more, more than 30 years and has an, a book coming out in 2018 that we're looking forward to maybe hosting here next. So, Stephen, I turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Maureen. So I, I, I'm really honored to be asked to moderate this discussion because there are four very impressive uh, folks on this panel. I've been reading Susan's book, and as I told Susan, I didn't expect anyone who worked for the Defense Department to be a good writer. <laughs> but she, she, she's written a very nice, very readable, very, very smart book, and it really 
lays out very well the history of uh, Coalition of Mockery Workers. And you know, Greg Asbed, I met Greg first, I think 1997, 1998. Yeah. I was down nice. in Florida doing a story about horrific housing conditions for farm workers. And you were a fairly small organization. I thought, this ain't going, I, you know, I thought, this ain't going anywhere. <laughs> And now, now 20 years later, and I, I've written a, about coalition market workers in my book, you know, I think for my money, it's one of the two or three most effective worker organizations, non-union worker organizations in the country in terms of lifting workers. It's really made a serious difference in the lives of 30, 35,000 farm workers and lifted not just them, but their families. And I first met Gerardo a long time ago when he was no, um, when he was a rank and file worker, and I've seen him develop into a true leader. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Food Chains. He he plays a big role there. I was at a training, and and uh, and uh, Gerardo was speaking to about three four hundred workers about safety issues and how to avoid sexual harassment, and uh, he's a very very impressive worker leader. And John S. Forms. It was very courageous, you know, for years and years, the tomato growers refused to deal with uh, the Coalition of Mockery Workers. They basically boycotted, uh, they wouldn't talk to them, they wouldn't negotiate, and any um, grower that agreed to pay the five, the, the a penny more a pound that, that the coalition was working for, any grower that agreed to do that was going to get fined $100,000. And John kind of bucked the tide and, and made, reached a deal with the coalition and really his agreement, his courage in reaching a deal has really um, broken the dam and got things flowing. And it's, made, it's really made a huge difference down there. So uh, let me start with a question for Greg. Um, you were involved in the founding of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Tell us about why and how the coalition was founded. Uh, well, let's start with the why. Um, you heard from Susan some of the conditions that, that existed in Immokalee in the past, and that continue to exist, frankly, outside of the fair food program and agriculture. Um, I think, what's the saying, that uh, life is solitary, poor, and nasty, brutish, and harsh? Is that the <laughs> Hobbesian version of life outside of society? Immokalee was essentially outside of society, you know, um, at least when we were first there, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world where you would see people getting beaten in the central parking lot after getting their check because they complained about the fact the check wasn't as much money as they thought it should be. Um, and nobody would come to their defense. You were by yourself. You were alone. And there was this, this sort of um, sense of the, the daily exercise of raw power that defined the town and, and a deep imbalance of power that allowed that to happen. Um, and so. But rather, I mean, rather than describe it and give you a couple of examples, uh, Alejandrina is a is a worker who today very mm -hmm. luckily works at John's one of John's farms, um, but she's been here for over twenty years, and she was talking to CNN not too long ago, and she described her experience when she first got to the country twenty years ago, and she said I was fourteen years old, and um, you know, first thing I did was go to the fields to work, and a boss said. You know, I can get you a better job. You're too young to be in the fields. I can get you a better job in the packing house. It's nicer. We work by hours. Just jump in my truck and we'll go there. And you can imagine what happened next. Mm -hmm. uh, he attempted to assault her. Fortunately for Alejandrina, um, another worker saw what was happening. He intervened. She, what, he, what the boss wanted to do didn't happen, but both she and the other worker were fired the next day. So that. 14-year-old girl's experience in the fields 20 years ago is not an isolated thing. It hasn't stopped happening. It still happens in the fields in different places in the country. Not under the Fair Food Program, but it is typical. It is something that would, is one of the extremes that's not untypical. Another example is uh, we were doing, I was working with a group called Legal Services, Florida Rural Legal Services early on in Florida. And we were doing outreach, um, talking to workers, and some workers came up and said, uh, could you help us get our last check from the boss we were working for before? And my colleague and I said, sure. We do that all the time. No problem. What's up? Why, don't you, why didn't you get your last check? And they said, well, we had to take off in the middle of the night. And we said, well, why did you take off in the middle of the night? And they said, well, the police came. So we asked why the police came. And it was because one of the workers stood up 
and said, you know, we don't have to work by force. We don't have to stay here. If we want to change employers, we can. This is America. We're allowed to move from one job to another. We don't have to do this. And he got shot. And so the police came. And so we left. So we need our last check. And so for us, you know, the last check was important. We got that last check. But um, that was the beginning of an investigation that led to the, a seminal case in the uh, modern anti-trafficking movement um, called U.S. versus Miguel Flores. And, uh, you know, that was, that was an introduction for us to, the, to the, another extreme of labor conditions when we first started organizing, which was forced labor. So those are the two sort of examples that you can, you can take from concrete experience that, that we've had to see what the worst can be. But then there's everything else in between. There's daily humiliations. For women, it's a, a daily barrage of, of comments and, and unwanted advances. Uh, you know, for everybody, it's, it's wage theft and, and unsafe working conditions. That's what led to organizing in Immokalee. Um, how it happened? You know, those conditions exist everywhere, so why, didn't that why doesn't that happen everywhere? Why doesn't that spark change everywhere? And I really do think it's just one of those things that, you know, fate, essentially. There was a confluence of, of um, events in Haiti, Guatemala, Mexico in the early 90s that led to a lot of people who had experience in fighting for democracy and human rights in their own countries coming to the United States as refugees. And that experience is pretty powerful stuff. It leaves you with skills and approaches to working with a community that other people don't have. And it so happened that I also lived in Haiti for three years before going to Florida, before going to Florida and worked with some people who were at, actually in Immokalee at the same time that we got there. Um, and so we all got together and decided to, rather than just watch this parade of sadness go on, to actually use the skills that we had and start working with the community to see if we couldn't mobilize um, people to start demanding change. And so that's pretty much why and how it started back in the early 90s. Thank you. So Gerardo, can you tell us a little about how you first heard about the Coalition of Mockley Workers and why you got involved and joined, first as a worker, then as an organizer, and, and as an activist? Um, well, I, I've been a farm worker most of my life. I started when I was 11 years old. Um, when I arrived to the Mockley, I was it was because of work. You know, you hear about Imokali, you hear about tomatoes, oranges, and many other crops. Um, so when I first arrived to Imokali, uh, I became roommates with uh, workers who were part of the Cuello case, which is the second case of slavery that the coalition was um, able to bring to justice. And uh, through that case, well, I met them because the boss, I was picking tomatoes, um, the boss didn't pay uh, me and my, my friends. So we ended up being homeless for a few days, sleeping in a bus that happens to be owned by a crew leader, uh, which in oranges is the, we call them uh, chiveros. And this crew leader uh, offered us to, to sleep inside his home, you know? Um, and, and it so happens, we, we didn't accept because it, it was like five of us. Uh, what happened is that this, this crew leader was uh, a member of the coalition uh, at that point. Like he, he was a bus driver. Um, and he knew the guys that were part of the case of slavery. He was actually the point of contact between those workers who were escaping uh, from a case that happened uh, like, what, what was it, like nine miles away from mm -hmm. Mokali? In the swamps, in Corkscrew swamps. Um, in, the, in the swampy area of, uh, of Florida. So I met them, and we, we didn't know each other's story, uh, but as we uh, were just living together as roommates, uh, we started to share stories, and they told me about the coalition, invited me to the meetings. I got involved, and to me, that was a, a beautiful thing that was going on. Um, so I participated in a march that happened 234 miles uh, from Fort Myers to Orlando. That was one of the last actions that, as a community, Imokali was doing to uh, persuade the, the agricultural industry to sit at the table and to talk about how to eliminate all of the abuses that Greg was uh, talking about and that we were also experiencing in our own lives. 
So we carried a statue, the Statue of Liberty, um, brown skin, a tomato bucket instead of a church, um, and a, a, a book uh, that says human rights. <clears throat> and we were fighting for the recognition of, of uh, our humanity, uh, basically. It so happens that this statue is now, uh, it abandoned us for a good reason. Now it's living in DC. Uh, that is Smithsonian as part of the uh, exhibit, permanent exhibit of the American History Museum. Uh, it's called The Nation We Built Together. Uh, we carried that statue. That's how we met. Um, after that action, I couldn't just not continue to participate. Started to learn English because I didn't spoke a word back then by listening to people like you speak. So. <laughs> If I say something that yeah. doesn't make sense, it's all <laughs> your fault. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> so that's how, that's how I became involved with the coalition. We don't consider ourselves uh, activists, organizers. I mean, from my perspective and the perspective of many of us that form the coalition, we're just people fighting for a better life, and we, are, we have been able to achieve um, really important agreements that are transforming the lives of thousands of workers, and we're aiming to expand this, whatever it is possible. Okay. And John, can you tell us a little about you know, the history of your company, Sunrise, <coughs> and how you first met, got involved with, fought with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, that, 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 How much that, time you got? Let the better first first. <laughs> um, uh, Sunripe Certified Brands is a family owned, fourth generation family owned business, uh, partnership between the S Forms and the Heller families. We're uh, both immigrant families. Um, my family, the S Forms family, is originally from uh, town uh, Saloniki and uh, came over right before World War I and settled into New York. Um, the story that's in, important to me and important to this story is how we ended up in the produce and eventually in the farming business is that my great grandfather was working in a shoe factory in New York and got sick. And his doctor told him, you can't work in the factory anymore because of the airborne glue. And you need to work outside. And that started us in the produce business in New York with a push cart selling watermelons, eventually on the Bronx Terminal Market, and eventually reaching out to uh, farming op building farming operations first in upstate New York and eventually in, in Florida, California. We were in Cuba. Um, and that was the genesis of our involvement in agriculture. Uh, Sunripe Certified Brands is a partnership that, that was formed in 1982 between our two families who had been longtime friends and uh, partners in various deals. My relationship, the company's relationship with the CIW uh, is through the whole period of time that is being described both in the book and that you've heard up here as a very uh, adversarial um, essentially at war relationship. We were aligned with all the other growers in the state of Florida. Um, our own family background as farmers in California, we had gone through the wars in the 70s and 80s, uh, battling the UFW, uh, the United Farm Workers Union. And so there was a, a, a lot of angst involved with a confrontational type of a relationship. One that when we heard worker organization, the initial response was to put on the flak jacket and get ready for war. That was our own reality. Um, I actually have a scar behind my ear from a rock I took during a UFW strike in 1989. So that was where we came from as we approach this relationship. Uh, my personal relationship to this is that I didn't know anything about the CIW until the mid-2000s. 
Uh, I am, uh, I guess I'll say it out loud, I'm a recovering alcoholic and uh, who, uh, whose family had to fire him in the mid-90s because of my alcoholism. And I did not return to the produce business until the mid-2000s when I had achieved my own personal recovery. I tell that because that informs part of the rest of the story uh, in terms of my involvement and my willingness to uh, look at myself, look at our company, and acknowledge our own behavior in the past and do something different. Uh, as far as coming to a place where I touch on my relationship with the CIW, as I said, I didn't know anything about it. What I did know was that our name kept popping up on the front page of the New York Times <laughs> <coughs> related to human trafficking. There's a lot of relationships up here. <laughs> a, a tangled it was, um, it was all fake news. Right. <laughs> the, the failing New York Times. And quite frankly, the way the, the genesis of this was that uh, I read in the New York Times, uh, you know, our family's name and our company uh, once again and um, asked all of my partners, uh, you know, what's the deal here? Has anybody ever met the folks at the CIW? Because this is crazy. And we all, they all acknowledged that we had abdicated our, our, our responsibility in this story to the grower organizations who were representing us. And I looked at everybody and I said, well, how's that working out for you? you know, let's do something different about that. And, and they all agreed. And at that stage, we reached out to the CIW and uh, set up our first meeting. Susan, uh, can you discuss you know, why didn't the government do more in the first instance to improve conditions for the farm workers? So farm workers have always been on the outside. Um, it goes back, as I mentioned in, in my sort of opening remarks, to our history with slavery, to our uneven relationship with immigration. But it was really codified in uh, the 1930s when you had some of the major labor legislation, the National Labor Relations Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, 1935 and 1938, I think. Um, these uh, major, I mean, really transformational pieces of legislation provided protections that we now take for granted, um, eliminating child labor, uh, providing for overtime, the right to unionize, right to organize, that sort of thing. Uh, there were two categories of laborers that were left out, farm workers and domestic workers. If you think for a moment, you can figure out why those are the two categories. In order to pass the legislation, they needed the Southern vote. And African Americans were the people that worked in those two categories. They are the ones on the farm fields. They are the ones uh, providing de domestic support. And so they were left out of these major pieces of legislation. And they were really left behind. Um, even now, they don't have the same protection as other workers. Uh, there were some changes in the 1960s, particularly after uh, extraordinary documentary, uh, Harvest of Shame, that was shown in 19, on Thanksgiving 1960. Uh, a few changes again in the 70s. But as a rule, they've been left out of uh, standard protections. Greg, can you tell us about you know, how, why coalition marketing workers initially targeted Taco Bell and then Burger King in its campaigns, and how did you mount a campaign, and how did you ultimately win? Well, because Taco Bell makes farm workers poor. Yeah, there <laughs> Clearly, you have it. Everyone knew that at the time. Um, well, you know, as I think Susan had mentioned in her intro, the, we'd spent nearly a decade, and John mentioned as well, um, at loggerheads with the, the local growers, right? And we made some progress, but as Herada was saying, you know, what we wanted to do was, was just have a better life, right? We wanted to have a community that could solve problems that had been plaguing it for years, from poverty to just absurd abuses. And that wasn't happening. So we had to find, and, and, and to, to take the analysis a little bit deeper, the, the, problem, the problem wasn't sexual assault. The problem wasn't slavery. It was the imbalance of power that made those things possible. 
That's what it is. It's the imbalance of power that makes it possible for someone to exert their will over someone else, and that other person have no ability whatsoever to hold that person accountable. And that's what existed for so long, and we needed to change that. Um, so we had to find some source of power that would allow us to take the scales and balance them again in a, in a way that would essentially take those emergent properties of the imbalance and wither them away. So that if you, if you re-strike the balance, where you have a, a humane, uh, you know, civilized relationship with the people who, are, who would have done those things in the past, those things stop happening. And that's what we were seeking. So eventually, there are, you, know, you beat your head long enough against a wall, and you realize the wall's not going away. You have to find another way to get around it. And, and we found that there was a voice that the growers had to listen to. They didn't have to listen to ours for a number of the reasons that Susan explained. But they had to listen to the voices of their customers. They couldn't refuse to hear the Walmarts and the McDonald's and the, and the, the, the uh, other major buyers of the world. And in fact, the, the, over the past several decades, the food system had consolidated significantly at the top, creating a power at the top that was, um, if you remember what the analysis was about imbalance of power, there was a power at the top that was essentially being used as market power to drive down prices, and that on the farm side of the farm gate meant lower and lower wages and worse conditions. But in effect, that power is neutral. It's not necessarily negative. It's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily create negative consequences for workers. It's simply that it's never harnessed to create positive consequences for workers. We decided that we'd be the first to harness that power, to change the, the direction of its impact and to actually improve workers' lives rather than impoverish them. Right? So the analysis was that there was this opportunity for us to address companies like Taco Bell, inform them of the conditions in their supply chain, and they would come to us and say, how can we help? Because we certainly don't want slavery in our supply chain, and we certainly don't want sexual harassment or sexual assault or any of the other problems you're talking about. What can we do to help? <laughs> Turns out it didn't work that way, though. Um, <laughs> we were wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We sent letter after letter and um, didn't get any response. And, uh, and so finally, we decided that we'd have to go to the public and educate the public, which is where the clever slogan about Taco Bell making farm workers poor came from, which we had to spend about four years explaining to students across the country in particular and people of faith and others um, until there was enough pressure on Taco Bell on, particularly on university campuses where students were saying, how do we know that the tomato in our chalupa wasn't picked by a slave? Can you promise that? And that was a tough question back then. There was no fair food program. And so um, students were actually demanding on their campuses that Taco Bell be removed from the campus until it could answer that question, until it could meet with the CIW and, and work with the CIW to be able to answer that question. And so that's how it started. Um, and from there, Taco Bell, uh, after four years of campaign, signed an agreement in 2005. McDonald's followed, Burger King followed, most of the fast food industry followed, with one exception, which remains an exception today, which is Wendy's. We can talk more about that some other time. Um, we talk, have a boycott Wendy's. Wendy's shirt out here. <laughs> Outside, there's information that you can learn about. Um, but. Uh, now there's 14 companies that support the Fair Food Program, everything from Walmart to McDonald's and Whole Foods. Um, and it's their purchasing power. Mm -hmm. It's the power of, in the industry, they call it the power of the purchasing order. Right? And in fact, just real briefly, we're not the first to imagine this. The industry itself dealt with this. Right? The industry had a problem that was an existential problem for the food industry, which was salmonella, E. coli, foodborne illnesses. Right? At some point not too long ago, the retail end of the food industry insisted to its, to its suppliers that to be a supplier, to be able to sell to those major buyers, you had to meet food safety standards. You had to be certified for food safety standards. Those didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but they do now. Right? And by using the power of the purchasing order, saying if you don't meet these, if you're not certified, you can't sell to us. They actually have made a major dent. I mean, you can't get rid of everything, but they have made a major dent in, in foodborne illness outbreaks. The exact same mechanism is what we are using to stop sexual assault, slavery, wage theft, and all the other things that have plagued 
farm workers and farm labor for, for generations. I, I, I often tell people one of the cool things, if I may use that word, about the Coalition of Mockley Workers is who enforces for you? Who makes sure that the growers uh, it, you know, uh, you know, <coughs> comply with uh, the workers' rights? It's Walmart, it's McDonald's, right. it's Taco Bell. Like, if growers you know, violate workers' rights, then they pull their orders. So instead of having the government enforcing, you actually have these, you know, the power of the purchasing order. But it's a real important power. We should make this a very popular program in D.C. today. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we thank the Walmart example. Foundation for, <laughs> yes. no, seriously. Uh, so the, the program describes itself as a worker-driven program, worker-driven social responsibility. Corrado, can you talk about the importance of it being worker-driven and when you had all these church groups and uh, synagogues and rabbis and student groups supporting you, how did the worker, how did it remain worker driven and not have these other groups end up running the show? Uh, well, in, in both instances, when we are uh, in, in a tour, right? The example that Greg was uh, sharing about Taco Bell. Uh, since the very beginning, we started to talk to people in um, every space that was uh, willing to hear about what we were trying to communicate, which was we're aiming to bring corporations to the table so that we can, working with them, also bring um, the agricultural industry to have a conversation and end all of these abuses. When we were talking with uh, all of these different audiences, we made sure that they understood that this was we were not asking people to save us. We were not asking anybody to come with the right answer for our uh, issues. Uh, we were not looking for experts, because we are experts in our field. And uh, contrary to what many people and many experts said about farm workers, we also have the wits that are necessary to be able to create what we created, uh, for instance, the Fair Food Program. So we made sure that people understood. and. Um, we were actually using an equation that we created in Immokalee, uh, C plus C equals C. Now, we're not mathematicians, obviously, <laughs> nor scientists, and we will not be, we're not aiming to be, but we are people that have the capacity to analyze things and be able to share our message um, in an effective way. So for us, C plus C equals C is consciousness plus commitment equals change. What that meant, the reason why that was really important uh, to be used in Immokalee while organizing with our uh, uh, community, as well as in uh, educating people in uh, universities and churches, is that you cannot just jump, you know, when you hear about an issue, and many people uh, have the tendency to jump to solutions right away without consulting with the community that is fighting for, for the rights that are necessary in their community. So some people, when we tell the story, they want to empty uh, their garage and bring it to our doorsteps. We <laughs> talk to people and say, yeah, that is nice, but what we need is justice. We don't work uh, 10 to 14 hours a day, every day of the year that's, that's uh, work available. Um, and, and don't wonder uh, or don't ask ourselves, like, why is it that we still have to depend on people, uh, goodwill, to be able to uh, put food on the table? Because in Thanksgiving, there's a lot of people that come from different uh, rich communities to give free food to our people. And that's, that's a question that for us, um, you know, when talking to people, we, we make sure that they understand. We're asking for justice not for charity, and we are the people who will educate you about what the issues are, and then when people decide to come with us and commit, the, the unavoidable result of that is change, and we've seen that. So in one end, it is crucial that whatever the community is trying to, to accomplish, that that is clear from the beginning to whoever is listening that the struggle needs to be led, uh, or led by workers. In the implementation side of things, with all the agreements that we have, the reason why the Fair Food Program works is because when 
we go to the fields. We conduct sessions of education, which uh, basically are about an hour long. We talk about all the rights that we have uh, under the program that, that the workers have. And um, they receive a booklet like this that contains all the rights that are part of the agreements with the different growers. When that happens, uh, workers know that they are protected for the first time. That under this program, there are market consequences that you were mentioning that will be triggered if any company, tomato grower, refuses to do what they have agreed to do under this program. So every worker, when they hear their rights and when they know that these rights are guaranteed in their workplace, then they are going to complain. It started slowly, but surely. Uh, when we started with the sessions of education, workers started to call and then see how the program worked, report all kinds of abuses, sexual harassment, wage theft, situations of violence in the fields, all the things that we knew existed. But for the first time, workers also witnessed how those abuses were fixed. And surprisingly enough, people who reported them were not fired or beaten like in the past. <laughs> so that is what, what the program is um, and why it is important. We have 30, 35,000 uh, workers that have, because of those protections, because of those uh, market consequences, and because of the work that we uh, collaborate with um, the industry, they become monitors of their own rights. And that is the most powerful thing. That's what makes the complaint-based uh, mechanism uh, so effective. Question for John. I, I, about you know, uh, John and his company were the very first one to sign, grow it or sign an accord with uh, the Coalition of Mockley Workers. And I remember reading a, an article about this. <coughs> And it said that you were in a rush to do this before the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, and you wanted to reach the agreement before sundown. Uh, so you were the first to sign on. I want to ask you, you know, what caused you to finally, you know, go from war to peace with the coalition of workers? And you must have felt a lot of pressures from other growers, from your 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 buyers, from some of the big companies that had signed on to the, uh, you know, fair food agreement uh, that were probably pushing you to sign on. And then you probably felt pressures from the, you know, the, your, your family members and from uh, farm workers as well. So can you discuss sure. that? Um, first of all, I mean, and I don't know whether I was living in a vacuum or what was going on. <clears throat> um, but the point at which my partners and I had that conversation, which I referenced before, and the signing of our agreement was maybe two months, of which the first month was our attorneys speaking to each other to mm. get a confidentiality agreement so we could even sit down and talk. Um, my perspective on it and my relationship to it is that we had no pressure from outside from any of our competitors because they didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Um, I had no pressure from customers because they didn't know what I was doing. And I had no, I, we really, I guess what I'm saying here is that, you know, our decision to sit down and meet with the coalition was our business, our interest, and our desire to understand who and what they were um, before we proceeded any further. That first meeting, I mean, we, we call it the cup of coffee now, but I walked in and, mm -hmm. and met with uh, Greg and Lucas, and the first thing I told them is, I'm here to have a cup of coffee and decide whether I like you and I trust you, because if I don't, we're not going anywhere. Um, that was the purpose of our first meeting. I very quickly um, identified that not only was I sitting with someone who I liked, mm -hmm and I felt a kinship with, um, but that I was sitting with folks who were advocating on behalf of the people that I'm in the lifeboat with, mm -hmm. which is the farm workers. We all, we go onto that farm and that's our lifeboat, right? That's how we all feed our families. That's how we all pay our bills. 
Um, and in seeing my business, our business that way, um, what I realized was that, what I understood was that I had more in common with the folks that come to work with us every day than I did with any of my competitors. They're in a competing lifeboat. This is ours, that's theirs, you know? Um, I think, is that? So one, yeah, oh, the Yom Kippur piece. You wanna know why I was in a hurry about Yom Kippur? So, I mentioned earlier that I'm in recovery. Um, part of my recovery was I got sober at a, uh, a nonprofit faith-based Jewish rehab in Los Angeles called Beit Teshuva, and part of that was a lot of study. Um, Yom Kippur is the finishing of the days of reflection um, and the start of the new year. So I was anxious to be able to, because I was in this process, uh, to start the new year with this agreement. So one historical footnote. So the very first strike by the Coalition of Mockley Workers was in 1995 when John's company cut uh, the pay rate for workers and 3,000 uh, tomato workers walked out for about a week. And then 22 decades later, your company was the first to sign. Uh, so Greg. Atonement, uh, atonement was struck, yeah. Excuse me? Atonement was made, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> attention, must be, attention must be paid. Um, tell us, Greg, about worker-driven social responsibility. How does it differ from corporate social responsibility? And where else do you see worker-driven social responsibility being applied? And where else might it be expanded? You can talk about that for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, John's example, I, I, I want to work in John's example as, as the sort of thing that actually companies should be doing broadly, but I'll, I'll start. So worker-driven social responsibility, WSR, we, we gave it is a paradigm, a new paradigm for protecting human rights and corporate supply chains that grew out of the Fair Food Program and the success of the Fair Food Program. I mean, we've, we were in one of the harshest laboratories that you could possibly choose. We had a theory of change that if you harness the power of the, per of the buyers, you could actually drive uh, an improvement of conditions on, on the ground in agriculture. And that theory, we tested against reality in, in the Florida tomato industry, and, and the results were beyond anything we ever expected, frankly. So that was great. And we, we know there are certain elements to worker-driven social responsibility that are necessary for it to, to work. We sort of isolated those from everything else and started to present that to the world as a, as a new paradigm, you know, a new way to actually protect workers' rights in, in, in corporate supply chains. Um, corporate social responsibility and worker-driven social responsibility share something in common, which is they both have standards, right? So in any corporation today, any 21st century corporation, you'd be hard pressed to find any company that doesn't have a code of conduct for its suppliers, right? It's expectations for its suppliers that it requires them or expects them to meet. Um, but you'd be equally hard pressed to find any company that has an enforcement mechanism that is real behind those standards. And therefore, the standards are a little more than paper, just a fact. And standards without enforcement for workers are not just paper, they're a lie. Because they're telling you you have rights. So what if, what, if, what if Alejandrina had seen that there was a corporate code of conduct in her case and saw that she had rights and she stood up and went to the company and complained, what would happen to her 20 years ago? She might not just get fired, she might get beaten. She might get worse. Because there is no enforcement, there is no protection, there is no reality behind that, that, those standards. That's 99% of corporate social responsibility today is still that, standards without enforcement. Worker-driven social responsibility is social responsibility led and, and monitored and enforced in a partnership between workers, growers, and, and buyers. And so you need, many of the elements have already been talked about. Um, you know, workers' experience and insights on the job inform the standards, the code of conduct. So you have things in worker-driven social responsibility codes that are very different from the ones that you find in the corporate drawn code. Things that are very specific to how you actually do get, you know, exploited on the, on the particular job. So 
That's one thing. Worker to worker education, so that workers actually, like Gerardo was saying, so that workers who are working under those rights actually know what rights they have. Because what good is it to have rights if you don't know what they are? If you can't actually, when something happens, you don't know that that's a violation of your rights and what you can do. Third, a, an effective complaint mechanism that workers trust, that workers know is efficient and, and fast, right? Um, and fourth, uh, deep dive audits. You know, the one thing that corporate social responsibility will say is that we don't just have a code, we have audits. We audit behind our code. Well, those audits are one day superficial snapshots of what happens in the fields generally or anywhere else, you know, whether it be apparel factories or the fields. Generally, auditors will go in, they'll talk to less than 5% of the workforce, um, and they'll be gone. You know, and most times the, the, the company knows when they're coming, they'll tell the, the workers what to say, and the whole thing is essentially not just a snapshot, it's a faked snapshot, right? In this case, the, the audits are, you know, work, the, the Fair Food Standards Council that, that in our case monitors the, the program talks to at least 50% of the workers, and that doesn't matter if it's a 2,000 person farm. You know, they talk to 1,000 workers before they leave to get a real solid picture, a highly pixelated picture of what they, of what's happening out there. Um, and they get into the books and they talk with the management and they talk about management systems and then they work with management to actually make sure that there are systems in place that can guarantee compliance. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a gotcha program. It's not there designed to, to catch farms. It's there to help farms identify bad actors, bad practices, get rid of them so that they don't become actual risks for the farm or for the people who are buying from that farm. And then behind all that is the market consequences that you heard about. So if there's a corrective action plan at the end of an audit, for example, or at the end of a complaint system, and the grower is reluctant to, say, fire a crew leader who's been found to be serially harassing women because that crew leader has been a really good crew leader for a long time, then that grower has to make a decision. Stick with the crew leader and leave the program and not be able to sell to the 14 companies that have signed on, or get rid of the crew leader and continue in the program and continue selling to those companies. And that decision, far more often than not, has been made the right way, to get rid of the person who's been doing those things, stay in the program, and become a better operation. So as a result, what's happened in the fair food program is that companies have become better operations. The companies that buy don't have to worry about public relations crises popping up because of slavery or rape or whatever else happens in their supply chain, and workers lead dignified lives. Now, the last thing I just wanted to say about this is that what John did um, was absolutely crucial to making it happen where, where we are, to, to breaking the, the resistance that had been there for centuries. I mean, it was, the roots were centuries back um, on, the, on the grower side in, in Florida. But it's something that, that all companies, be they suppliers or buyers in this century, need to consider and need to, need to see the kind of leadership that John did. Because what John did was, was find a way to align his values, his company's values, with their business model. You know? And when you're out of alignment, when you have a business model that drives, inherently drives negative outcomes, then that's where problems happen. That's where problems fester. And that's where things that could be fixed become major crises, right? And so John was talking about being on the front page of the New York Times for slavery. That's what was happening at that point. But John was able to do something that, that, that more and more companies need to do, and it takes visionary leadership to do, unfortunately, but it's, it's to say, you know, it's to look at, at your business model, identify the inherent problems in your model, and, and fix them, align them with your values as a company. You know, the, the last thing I'll say is that you could get away with not doing that last century, 20th century. You can get away with it because basically consumers trusted corporations a lot more than they do today, and we didn't have the expectations we do of them today to help solve social problems like climate change or sexual harassment or whatever it might be. Today, we trust corporations a lot less, and yet we have much higher expectations of corporations to help us solve problems. So this gap is growing. And the only way that you can actually kind of bridge that gap is to do what John did, which is to align your values with your business model and to actually make that, become an advocate for that, which is the other thing John did, which is to step up and advocate 
that this is the best way to do business, right? And when you do that, consumers see that you're sincere, consumers see you're authentic, and you will thrive in this century of, of information, you know, the information age. 20th century, you can do whatever you want. Now, it's not the same. <laughs> not so much. One last question before Q&A. So <coughs> Susan, so you're a policy, anal policy wonk, a systems analyst. You know, what do you think other businesses, other worker groups should, can draw from the uh, example of Coalition of Mockley Workers? And what might it mean for future research into poverty, inequality, uh, you know, worker efforts? So, first of all, I think what's, this partnership is very important. This is a program that has benefited not just the workers, but also, as Greg was just uh, touching on, the growers themselves, operations are better uh, because they now have people in the fields who are saying, here's how we could do things better together, uh, that they are, they have a much more stable workforce. So if you're trying to reduce turnover, et cetera, having a safe workforce, uh, a safe place for your workers gives you a more stable workforce. For the buyers at the top of the food chain, most of all, what they have is a brand protection. That's, what that's their value, that's what they're worried about. They know that they have a clean supply chain in a way that no other program has delivered. I have one point here real quick for the, um, not just uh, the buyers, et cetera, but I think for all of us to take away is that change is possible. And change is possible if we start looking for new places for new solutions. Uh, one of the things that's growing as the world has changed it's important that we look beyond the government for solutions. If we're waiting for the government, it's not going to get done. And because there's some things the government does well and other things they don't do so well. We've never done well in the issue of labor or in workers or working conditions, et cetera, for a variety of different reasons. Non-governmental solutions to persistent and complex policy problems is something we all need to be looking for. And the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, the Fair Food Program, is an extraordinary example of that. Thank you. you know, one of the amazing things about what you've done is it's you know, without any government assistance. It's all, all within the private sector. Maybe that's why it's worked. Yes. <laughs> uh, so opening the floor to uh, questions. Uh, this uh, right there. lady back there. Hi. Thank you. I, I learned a lot. My name is Dr. Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services. So we're interested in ways to uh, reduce conflict, uh, give people opportunities to transform their lives. So my question is this. In terms of the farm worker workforce, are there any provisions in terms of education to move up if they wish in uh, the chain of um, management uh, with perhaps the company, um, learning other skills that they could go into um, accounting, they could go into um, health policy or at least public health uh, related to agriculture production. What opportunities are there for people to further their own education while staying within that agricultural sphere? John Harada or Greg, you could, you could answer. Do you want to talk about anything in specific? Uh, I mean, the comment that I'll make on that, I learned, I have learned so much in my relationship with Gerardo, with Greg, with Lucas Benitez. Um, there's a whole movement right now with fair trade and all of these different types of programs that are out there um, where there are schools attached to it, there's stores with discounted food available, that sort of thing. And one of the most important conversations that I've ever had was with Lucas Benitez. We were talking about this issue and, and he looked right at me and he said, I don't need you to tell me where my kids should go to school. I don't need you to provide cheap food for me. As Gerardo was mentioning before, they don't need free turkeys in Immokalee on Thanksgiving. No more. What they need is to be, <laughs> Keep your free what people need is to be treated fair at work, have a safe place to work, be paid a fair wage, and live their lives. And that resonated for me, both as a business owner <laughs> and as a human being, because quite frankly, I don't want anybody telling me what resources are available 
to me or my kids. So I don't know if that if that answers your question, but that's how I would uh, what I would say about that. Um, the woman with the black hat. <laughs> black hat. <laughs> uh, yeah, Thank Ellen you know. Taylor. Uh, I used to work for OSHA for a number of years, and so I know your frustration, and I know that we need to look in new places for new solutions. But particularly, um, I also used to teach at the Labor College in New York City, uh, and um, so I know a little bit about the history of labor unions. They used to be social justice and social improvement organizations before they became power brokers, and they had clinics and schools and childcare centers, and I'm wondering if that's part of your vision for the CIW? Well, we, you know, with the, with the hurricane that just, just passed by in Irma. Mokali, yeah. uh, Hurricane Irma, there was a lot of people that um, in the past wouldn't support what we were trying to do, which is change, you know, expand the gains that we have achieved with these agreements. And, uh, yeah, it's, it was a difficult thing to be able to uh, direct people to support what we are doing, but a lot of effort in trying to support uh, charity work related. So, sorry, I lost train of thought. <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me say something. I, you kind of hear the same thing coming from this stage here, which is, and, and I'll take it in a different direction, which is, with this new paradigm that we have, uh, WSR paradigm, there are millions of workers who are still working, not just in the fields, but in apparel factories and dairies and, and poultry and whatever you have, you know, that, that are suffering the same things that we have been able to eliminate in the tiny sector of where we are in the fair food program. We could work until we're dead and then three more times of life and death to get what we've done to those workers first, before we worry about those other things. When people, I often ask people to do, do a little thought experiment, right? So do people here like to buy from fruit stands? You know, summer fruit, like fresh fruit from a local farm, right? I know these, I grew up around here, so the Eastern Shore, if you drive out there in the summertime, it's beautiful stuff out there. So imagine you're driving up into a fruit stand and it's everything you ever hoped for. Beautiful, colorful fruit, smelling fantastic. You grab a bag, you fill all your stuff up. You go to the cashier. The cashier's got a little ruby cheek kind of look and everything. And, um, and they're, they're, they're checking you out. And as you're just feeling that happy buzz you feel at those places. And then you hear a scream. And you look over the cashier's shoulder, and you see a worker being beaten, pistol whipped, by the boss, in the farm that's producing the stuff that's in your beautiful bag of colorful, fragrant fruit. What would you do? Would you complete the purchase? Anybody? No, right? Most people would stop, at least run away in horror, right? Some people would try to stop it from happening. We're the organization that tries to stop it from happening. But the thing is, that's happening everywhere. So there's a hierarchy of needs in a way. There's a sort of, you know, you start by stopping people from getting beaten, stopping people from having their checks stolen, stopping people from being sexually harassed. Once you've done that as far across as you can, then you start doing those other things. And there is so much work to be done still in low-wage labor to get this model out and to give people the power they need to redress the imbalance of power that makes those things happen in workplaces across this country and across the globe that we just don't have time for those things yet. We're only so many people and so many resources. Yeah, and what I was going to say That's is it. we are trying to direct the resources um, that are coming into town through the relationships we have with other organizations to be able to create um, together with them, uh, not directly as uh, the CAW, but working with people, telling them, like, this is a good place to start in terms of the housing. So there's different ideas um, that are being explored on that front. Um, but yeah, as Greg was saying, the list is, is huge and the priorities need to be at the center. Uh, we need to fix what hurts the most and then eventually we will expand in the same way that we are expanding the protections in the fields. Can I just make one quick comment on that? I had an opportunity to speak at UCLA Law School and one of the questions that came up uh, to the panel was, 
what, what new legislation do we need to see that these rights are guaranteed, you know? And what you're hearing from the three of us up here is that this isn't about new legislation, this isn't about a lot of different, this is about ensuring that the things that are on the books right now, like guess what, you're not supposed to steal people's wages. Guess what, sexual harassment is against the law. Guess what, slavery is against the law. Yeah. The resources don't exist in the, extensive reach, in the extended reaches of agriculture mm -hmm. to go ahead and enforce these laws. What this program has done for me, quite frankly, is give me a tool that on my 15,000 acres of farmland, I now have thousands of patrol folks, right? Because there are dark parts of our farm. And while I can sit here and say I'm about 99.9% .9 sure of how I might behave, I'm gonna give myself a little wiggle room. <laughs> As I go down the hierarchy of my management team, I become less and less certain. That's as it applies to management. Quite as it's kept, there's also a lot of worker-on-worker -worker harassment that can take place. So these are all things that this program has helped me as a business owner address to provide the fair, safe work environment that is already on the books I'm supposed to be providing. Uh, the gentleman right under the camera. Hi, hi. my name is Mike Golash. One of the things that when you think about worker standard is a decent wage, decent benefits, pensions, and things like that. It seems you don't really, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers doesn't really deal into that area and talk very much about that. So I like, you know, what are like the average wage of a farm worker in Florida as part of this uh, fair food program on a yearly basis? We, we haven't here yet, but we do talk about it very often. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's the whole reason why uh, the coalition started organizing uh, to address wages and to address working conditions. I would say in terms of wages, you know, uh, we were able to eliminate uh, the coping of a bucket. Now you may think that what the hell is he talking about, right? I would be asking the same question if I was you. Uh, for us as workers, the coping means 10% less tomatoes in every bucket that you bring to the truck. Uh, and I don't know if you would be able to see it, but this is how it used to be. This is how it is now. There were a lot of instances of violence in the fields. Uh, when you brought this bucket, and according to the standard of the dumper, which is the person on top of the truck, uh, was not full enough, you would be sent back to your row. If you protest about it, or if you comment or talk back, uh, you would very likely become another victim of violence in the fields. The bucket would be thrown to your face. <clears throat> so in the process of eliminating this, we became um, to, to address this issue by eliminating the uh, overfilling of the bucket and creating a new standard, visual standard. So that is in essence 10% uh, more production that for the first time is gonna be paid to you as a worker, that's one. Another one is the payment of the premium that since the implementation of the program uh, in 2011 on what is the uh, Florida Tomato Growers Exchange um, that we, we are working with, there's been uh, more than $26 million that have been distributed to workers in the form of a bonus clearly marked in their checks uh, as fair food program payment. It has different names, but it's, it's clearly identified by workers. It's not a lot. Uh, if you think about it, it can mean $20, $40, $60, or more, depending on the business interaction with the corporations buying tomatoes under this uh, program. What that means is the urgency of the public and of us together working to be able to bring more corporations to do the same because that amount should be much more than that. Right now we have, what, about 20% of the market mm -hmm. participating with us on this. We need corporations like Wendy's to do the same instead of running while workers created a solution 
for that problem, economic problem, and also the problem with the imbalance of power. When we find the solution and we're able to basically not just identify where slavery was happening, but stop it on its tracks, get rid of it, because there hasn't been a single case of slavery in any of the farms under the program. But there continues to be a lot of issues and violent situations happening outside, everywhere. So when we found a solution, what Wendy's did is basically punish the growers that were supplying them for years. Uh, growers that were providing the tomatoes, tomatoes that, you know, they were profiting from it. And now they decided to go to Mexico when we created the solution because the growers decided to participate with us. That is just wrong. So we need to do that uh, to bring more corporations to do the same, to increase more that bonus. Also, I don't know, uh, since we started to work with the agricultural industry in Florida as an industry, the wages have gone up. Um, it was 40 to 45 cents per 30 plus years. And in a span of six years, now it's 55 in average, 60 in some companies, even 65 cents. So I don't know, things are moving in the direction that they should. And I would bet that it is not a coincidence. I would say that it is because there is for the first time a working relationship, human to human, where we are taking into account all parts involved the things that matter most, which is the dignity of the workers. Okay. Um, I want to ask, uh, well, this is the lightning round, but I want to ask Greg one quick question. So uh, CRW has been such a success. What are the chances uh, you might ex you know, spread your wings to you know, the fruit industry in the Midwest, vegetable industry in the Southwest, or to all of California? <laughs> <laughs> or the world. Yeah. <laughs> what day is it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, we are currently in the, in the initial stages of, of talking with growers in Texas um, about watermelons and other crops. Uh, the program, we're working with a, a dairy worker organization in Vermont, as you well know, um, that, uh, that we're helping establish their own Milk with Dignity program. Uh, and they have Ben and Jerry's as their primary partner. As a corporate partner, and they're working with um, with farmers there, so it's expanding in that direction. Uh, you know, we have inquiries from all sorts of different directions, from workers, from corporations who want us to expand our footprint in their supply chain, um, and we're working through those things. Hopefully, it'll be in many, many, many more states. I mean, right now it's up the East Coast; it's in seven states and three crops, but we want it to be everywhere it can be. So now a so-called lightning round. Uh, if you wanted the members of the audience to take one thing from this discussion, be it a question to ponder, a fact to keep in mind, a call to action or something else, what would that be? Should we start with Greg or Susan? Susan, OK. <laughs> uh, as I said before, change is possible. If you want to change a system, look at the system as a whole. Um, I believe the Coalition of Mockley Workers and Fair Food Programs have done this. And we need to look at it as a new model for addressing uh, labor issues, for uh, labor issues that benefit the buyers, the corporations, as well as the workers. To you, John. Uh, OK. I'm not going to leave you with my words. I'm going to leave you with, with the words of uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. In a free society, some are guilty, all are responsible. We all bear the responsibility to ensuring that our fellow men and women are treated fairly in the workplace and at home and have safe places to go to work. So that's the challenge. That's what it means to be human. That's what it means to live in a community and be part of something. Call to action. New York City, 11 to the 15. We're gonna have. We're gonna do in front of uh, Nelson Peltz's office. Which which month, Toronto? Uh, March. Sorry. <laughs> um, I got excited. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be in New York, um, and we're extending the invitation to allies all over the, the country to join us. Uh, we're gonna do a fast uh, with presence for the entire day. Those five days. Uh, Nelson Peltz is a key. Uh, key uh, 
player within the structure of Wendy's. Uh, they are, uh, he's the president of a hedge fund called 3 n Partners. They invest a lot of money, profit a lot, and have a lot of power, but they refuse to use it. So we are going to their headquarters to ask them to exercise their power in a responsible way. Uh, we're gonna be joined by church leaders, by people from different universities in the country. And um, it's gonna, the culmination is gonna be a march. We hope to have, uh, to have thousands of people. So help us spread the word. Uh, 11 to the 15th of March, uh, join the farm worker community. And we are bringing the message that it is time uh, for them to do the right thing and to help us to expand uh, the protections against sexual harassment and violence in the fields. Um, and I would just close by saying that, you know, there's, there's no change that happens just because we wish mm -hmm. it would. Uh, we need action. The, the action is what has made it possible for every corporation to come on board to use their power in a responsible way, resulting in this transformation. It's, it's, not some, it's not science, it needs people on the streets. And we need to spread the word. And if we believe in this, uh, we shouldn't be uh, depending on someone else inviting us to do this. We know that there are many things that are wrong and need to be improved in the working places of America, but particularly in farm work. So let's do this together. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sharing this um, as an invitation. I don't want to convince you. Um, it's an order. It's an order. <laughs> we, yeah, that, that I command you to do that. No, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not asking you uh, this as a favor. Um, we shouldn't be asking this as a favor because uh, social change shouldn't depend on, on charity in a way, uh, on, on that regard. Uh, asking people, convincing people, uh, this should be about a basic understanding. You know, just think about this for a second. The food that you have in your tables, all the celebrations uh, that you have in that table with your family, with your friends, that food came from somewhere. We are the people responsible for those moments too, whether you have seen us, thought about us or not. And we're asking for the same ability to be able to, use, to do just that with our own family, but we need you to recognize that and stand with us and follow our lead. So. Uh, just to pick up on what Gerardo was saying, uh, markets are hierarchical structures, right? And power flows down. And what we've discovered is that the power in the food market, most people assume, ends at the major retail brands that we know. But that's where it stops, right? It's the top of the ladder. In fact, we are the top of the ladder. Consumers are the top of the ladder. The problem is we don't act in concerted ways like corporations do. And so we don't use our power, and corporations tell us how to think about food, and then they tell those beneath them how to produce food. When we act in a concerted fashion, as Gerardo was just saying, we can change that. We can actually tell corporations how we want food to be produced, in which case they then have to push that message down all the way to the farms and to the crew leader level so that life changes for those who produce our food. So if we act together, we can change not just the food system, not just the food market, but all the markets we, that we live in, electronics, clothing, all the sorts of things that we buy that, that, that we know conditions are not right behind, but we don't act on it. So. Thank you all so much. Please join me in thanking what a fabulous panel. <laughs> Susan is going to be signing books, so please um, uh, join us for that. And also, please come back on uh, February 21st. We'll be having Drivers of Opportunity, How Will Latinos Shape the Future of the American Dream? So please come back for that. And thanks again to this fabulous, fabulous panel for an inspirational and informative discussion. Thank you.